We are very close now to the 2024 election. So what is the state of the race? Laksha Jain is CEO and co-founder of Split Ticket, an organization that models, predicts, and analyzes the state of U.S. elections. Laksha joins the podcast to talk about how likely it is that Kamala Harris or Donald Trump wins the U.S. presidency, what people get wrong about polling and modeling, the state of the race in the House and the Senate, and what to look for on election night to signal whether Democrats or Republicans are going to have a good time. As always, thank you for listening to the podcast. If you want to drop us a like, a comment, subscribe, all of that is appreciated. And if you really want to support the podcast, you can do so by becoming a member of the Center for New Liberalism. Members get access to exclusive bonus episodes of the podcast, our Sticker of the Month Club, our community Slack with organizers, and much more. So become a member today at cnliberalism.org slash become a member. Thanks for listening and enjoy the episode. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the New Liberal Podcast, part of the Center for New Liberalism. I'm your host, Jeremiah Johnson, and joining me today is Laksha Jain. Laksha, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jeremiah. Really excited to have you here, and and we're kind of in the very final stretch here of election season. And so I guess at, at a 10,000-foot view, when I look at the election, I see... From, from kind of an analyst standpoint, I see one really exciting thing that happened, and then basically it's been very boring the rest of the time. Not much has happened in the polling averages. Is that kind of also how you view, it, it, at a very high level, the, the 2024 presidential election? I think it's remarkably stable, and that's crazy to say about a cycle in which we've seen the nominee literally switched out. But it is remarkably stable compared to many past cycles. Um, ever since Harris came into the race, she had that period of rapid ascension. And then things kind of stabilized. And people started, I think, looking for a reason to manufacture some type of drama or narrative. And I mean, uh, I think the reaction to polling movement has been disproportionate. I think maybe there may have been like a point of movement towards Trump, but it's so hard to tell because... We're not getting polls. That's the biggest thing in the cycle. We are literally not getting high quality polls at nearly the same rate we were in 2018 or 2020. And this has led to people trying to make all types of assumptions with data that is frankly not nearly as voluminous as it would have been. Can you give us some insight into the polling industry? Like, why is it that kind of just the sheer amount of polling has declined? Because I feel like this has been a trend that there was like way more polling in 2012, if you want to go way back to the normal politics era, you know, of, of Mitt Romney versus Barack Obama. And then kind of at, maybe in 2016, we had a decent amount. But in 2020 and 2024, it just seems like people have reported just there are less polls, especially the high quality ones. Why is that? Is it something about the economics of the polling industry or or what's going on there? Yeah, I think it's mostly the economics and the declining incentives to conduct polls and especially high quality polls. Surveys are really expensive to conduct because every time you contact someone, whether they respond or not, that costs you money. When response rates go down, then what happens is you're going to need to contact more and more people to get the same sample size. So now for a set of, for a poll of maybe a thousand likely voters, you're going to need to contact a hundred thousand people. Whereas before you could have gotten away with contacting 40, 50,000. And yeah, yeah. What, what do you call it? Uh, response rates have famously dropped and are like really, really terrible now, right? Basically, yeah. Um, I mean, in the 90s, your response rates were closer to like 20% above that. Now they're one to 2%. So you're getting to the point where it costs a lot to field these polls. And at the same time, the industry has taken such a big reputational hit over the last eight years that 
trust in polling is also down. And when you add to the fact that not only is trust in polling down, but media organizations are having a harder and harder economic time, you've got a perfect storm of, well, they don't really trust the polls, they have to pay more and more to conduct them, and they have less money than ever before. So you can kind of figure out from there why the number of polls has dropped so sharply. I also wonder, you know, as we talk about the polls, there's kind of this, um, this is not exactly what you guys do, I realize, but one of the dominant narratives of the last, you know, decade has, has been the shy Trump voter, that Trump's support was understated in 2016 and, and maybe also in 2020 because... People just don't like to admit that they're voting for Trump. And and certainly it, that was likely a thing in previous cycles. And people kind of debate, is it still a thing? Or have we actually reached the point where, no, all the Trump people are actually very proud of him now and, uh, and are no longer silent? It, it's unknowable to some extent. Like, what direction are the polls going to air this year? Are they going to air on the side of Republicans or of Democrats? Like, y- you can't tell ahead of time. But do do you have a sense of whether the polling industry has done a good job trying to correct for that whole, you know, silent Trump support phenomenon? They have. And I want to expound a bit on the difference between the shy Trump effect and the silent Trump effect. I think those are two different things. The shy Trump effect comes from the shy Tory voter phenomenon, as you may be familiar with. In the 90s, it chronically understated the conservative party's vote share in England. In that was actually the crisis of British public opinion polling. And the explanation was that these shy Tory voters were voting conservative after telling pollsters they were not. So they were basically saying the respondents are lying about what they would say. Now, there's no empirical evidence that this is what's happening with Donald Trump's support. It's not that his respondents are lying, and it's not that the poll respondents are dishonest about who they will support. Instead, we're having a silent Trump voter issue where you're not able to reach those Trump voters. That's fundamentally different from Trump voters are lying about who they will support. And actually, that's a much more fixable problem. If pollsters get respondents that just outright lie in large chunks, then your poll is just kind of screwed and there's nothing you can do. But when you're getting a sample composition issue in which you literally just don't have enough Trump voters or you don't have enough Republicans or you're not representing the right demographics, that's something you can fix. So that's what's been going on. In 2020, especially, no matter what you tried to wait on, you were literally just getting way too many democratic leaning or democratic inclined voters. And that happened whether or not you sampled enough Republicans or um, whether or not you waited on certain factors. It's just all across the board, you were getting people who were more likely to vote for Biden. It was a uniform non-response effect is what we call it. Um, The simplest explanation is this. Let's say your poll is 33% Democrat, 33% Republican, 33% Independent. Now, if Normally, that correlates pretty well with vote choice. Uh, You can assume the Democrats will mostly go for the Democrats, the independents will be split, and the Republicans will mostly go for the Republicans. In 2020, what happened was even the Republicans were more likely to go for Biden than you would have expected. And indeed, that was a false phenomenon, so to say. So so what you're saying, just to make sure I'm following, is that there's always some bit of the Republicans, 5% or whatever, that vote for the Democratic candidate and and vice versa. There's always some Democrats that end up voting for the Republican candidate. But you're saying even if you kind of split it by, okay, my sample is 33% Republican, you would be oversampling that person who says they're Republican, but actually ends up voting for Biden. Right. You might end up getting, say, like 12% of Republicans saying, yeah, I'm going to vote for Biden. And that number is too high, obviously, in 2020. That was way too high. But you got that anyways, because the Republicans responding to polls were the ones that were more likely to shift their vote preference to Biden. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It's just a, you know, I don't want to maybe there's, you know, that kind of thing you see with Trump and his supporters sometimes, which is kind of an oppositional, defiant kind of a 
the stance and and that could certainly extend towards the mainstream media and pollsters and you know we're just not going to engage with you Th- that kind of leads me into what my next question though is that you know this has been such a stable race the other big feature other than you know not having a ton of high quality polls and and the general nature of the problems with the polling industry but the other feature is that despite all that it's been very very stable why do you think that is i mean other than the one big jump where we had the big jump when Kamala announced and Democrats' chances. I think everybody acknowledges it was a good decision and Democrats' chances went up when they switched out Biden for Kamala Harris. But other than that, like what explains all this stability? Polarization is really high. The number of people willing to cross over for the other party is going down and down and down and down. And there's two factors to this. The first is that when partisanship goes up and polarization goes up, the amount of movement you will see is significantly less. You notice that you didn't see a debate bounce for Kamala Harris this time around that mirrored um, the same thing that a lot of other previous debate winners enjoyed. You saw maybe a point of a boost, but not that much. In the convention, Harris didn't get any convention bounce. This led to Nate Silver getting all types of criticism for building in a convention bounce when one didn't happen. So, These are the types of things that debate bounces, convention bounces, etc. These are all the types of things that would happen in a less polarized electorate. They don't happen anymore because the electorate is so polarized. And going back to that point you mentioned, right, are polls chronically understating Trump support again if we had the silent Trump voter in 2020, etc.? I actually don't think so because... Just as a simple, simple gut check, think about this. In the midterms, we had roughly 93% of Democrats vote for Democratic candidates for the House. 97% of Republicans vote for Republican candidates for the House. Crossover voting went up from 2020, but it was down from the last midterm in 2018. Given all the evidence you have about just polarization going up, given that Kamala Harris's favorables are broadly break even and Trump's aren't very different from 2020. And given the economy is not amazing, but not terrible by most standard metrics, we get to this point where you would broadly expect a repeat of 2020 in a lot of ways, right? That's just the logical corollary. Yeah. And that's kind of what we see, right? Is that right now? Exactly. Joe Biden, you know, won the popular vote by, I don't know, four or five or something like that. Four and a half. Yeah. And and Kamala Harris is- And Harris is up by about two. Mm Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's maybe I'm saying the same thing as you are, but it also when you say like polarization, but it also seems like, you know, we're running a candidate on the Republican side that voters are very, very familiar with. They've everyone in the country has already formed their opinion of Donald Trump. And for better or worse, every election he's in tends to be about him. And so Part of me thinks like there's just not much swinging to do. Everybody has either decided they're on Team Trump or they're not. And there's only like a small set of very unusual people who have not yet formed their opinion on Donald Trump. Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely part of it. You're not going to get a realignment election in broad swaths of society with a already defined candidate on the ballot. And, a, and his opposition being the vice president of the guy that ran against him last time. And like, this is fundamentally, people know who Donald Trump is, for better or for worse. And there's like 5% of people trying to make up their mind still, but that's not enough to provoke like a whole scale realignment of sorts. And that's that's where it comes down to. And the thing is, if you had a substantial red wave or something... Well, firstly, it didn't happen in the midterms and polarization's up, so you would expect less of a wave. But if you had the same polling error this time, you would get Wisconsin at Trump plus eight. And that just, just from a simple gut check, that's the type of thing where you're like, okay, hang on. Like, you can't apply polling error time over time to the, you know, the same polling error to different cycles. It doesn't work like that. Pollsters make changes. And this time around, the results we're getting broadly suggest something very much in line with what all the fundamentals, all of the non-polling indicators and everything suggests. So 
we've got a repeat election. We've got a guy who was on the ballot before who's on it again. We've got a, a vice president who is now the presidential nominee under slightly chaotic circumstances, but is broadly running as a continuation of the last administration. Why would you expect a massive, massive, massive change. And I'm not saying that can't happen, but I'm saying that you would need a hell of a lot of evidence for that. And we don't have that. Whenever like my friends and family have asked me about like, oh, what do you think is going to happen? Like, what's your prediction? I always just kind of shrug and say like, well, it, it, it's about a coin flip. Maybe you can lean one way or the other, but that that's basically it. It's, uh, it's a coin flip. And I always struggle with like something more intelligent to say than that. So I'll ask you the same question. Like, do you have any kind of, I don't want to say predictions, but like other than just saying it's a coin flip, what's the other ways that we can kind of talk about the predictions that we have for this race? Because it's a coin flip just seems unsatisfying as like, if that's the only thing we can take away from it. It is, it is unsatisfying. It is extremely unsatisfying to be told that it's a toss up. And... Yet that's, again, where we end up time after time. What's frustrating is that everyone already knows this time, after being burned in 2016, being burned in 2020, everyone not in an extreme partisan echo chamber knows that this election is likely to be close, or at least knows that there's no concrete evidence pointing to their side having a clear edge. And so they ask, what's the point of a model? Right? Like, what's the point of these polling aggregators, these models that you guys put thousands of hours of work into if you're just telling us the same thing we already know? And I think it's a valid question. I think it's a fair question. And if we run with that for a second, I would say the main thing is that journalists and media always look for momentum or a story to be written. They always want to say, What's happening? Can we explain what's happening? And this leads people to read into things that aren't there. They, it makes them make all kinds of bad decisions on how to cover a race, and it leads them to mismanage their coverage and misrepresent the odds. Over the last two weeks, you've gotten this narrative of a huge vibe shift to Trump. And the polling probabilities, or really the modeled probabilities based on polling averages and fundamentals, have gone from Harris at 57% to Harris at 50, 51, 52, 48. That's a change, sure. But is it big enough to say Trump is running away with the election like a bunch of anxious Democrats are calling Politico and saying, no, no. And that's the purpose of the model. It doesn't spend all day on Twitter. And it reminds you that these things are coin flips. You may know things are coin flips, but when you start reading Politico, The Hill, The Times, you're going to start thinking, oh my God, well, I know this one guy that flipped the Trump I'm seeing all these anecdotes. I'm seeing the newspaper columns. He must be surging. And the truth is, no, that's just a coverage issue. I love the idea that uh, the, the best selling point you could possibly give for using a model is the model doesn't spend all its time on Twitter. And like, there's something very brutal and very true about that for political sickos like you and me. <laughs> but yeah. um, I mean, it, there there has been this talk of a vibe shift, but I guess it's worth getting into like, I think, um, you know, some of the sites now favor Trump. I think 538 just flipped to Trump like 5149. And I think Nate Silver's model now favors Trump by just a little bit. But again, these are like, it's shifting from at, at most, you know, 5545 in one direction to 5545 in the other. And it's almost like a philosophical question. Does that really mean much? It, it means 10% of something, but but wh how much is that? How significant is that? You know, I, I, it's almost not a statistical question. It's more a question of like, well, what do you what do you want it to believe? Oh, yeah. And this is the type of thing where it gets really difficult because as modelers, we want to give probabilities because it's more precise to say that something is 55% for the Democrats rather than toss up or leans Democratic or whatnot. This is more granular. We can give estimates with better precision. We should. The problem with this is that if you do that, you get people making all kinds of inferences on a 55 to 45 shift. If Harris's odds were at 55% a month ago and there are 45% today, that's just consistent with a very, very close race that oscillates back and forth just a little bit. And yet you get these headlines saying Trump's advantage is now plus 10 
and Harris's advantage was plus 10 two weeks before. This is a 20-point shift to Trump. That's what Frank Luntz put. That's, that's ridiculous. I mean, those two models are saying almost the same thing. It's a very marginal difference in the picture of the race. It's the type of thing that gets easily washed out by polling error. But no one wants to listen to that because it doesn't sell and it's not as fun. But if you watch basketball and the score is 73 to 71, what's your conclusion? Is it that the team at 73 is conclusively and determinatively a favorite? No, it's that this is a very close game. And if the lead goes to 80 to 75 and then 85 to 80, you shouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like one of the things that I think if I'm trying to step into someone else's shoes and like explain the human psychology of this. Let's say, you know, Harris was at 58% in your model at one point. Um, that may have been around her high point was 58% in the split ticket model. And then she drops down and she drops down and now she's at 51%. And let's say she keeps dropping up until election day until she's like 38% or something, right? Um, let, let's just say that's how the model goes. She could still win at 38%. That's that's very easy to happen. Like things that are 38% happen all the time. That's like a, a an all-star level baseball player getting a hit in an at bat. You know, that's like Steph Curry making a three. You know, that's a 38% uh event. And so that kind of thing happens all the time. And yet it would feel very weird if she had dropped from 60% down to 38%, kind of a continuous drop in the model. And then one anyway, like it, it would be against what we expected. And I, I think that just it doesn't sit well with people, especially if you like, you know, you could maybe phrase it a different way. It would be easier if you said, well, Harris's national lead went from three and a half points to one and a half points, but she ended up winning anyway, um, because, you know, a one and a half point lead would be questionable for her given the electoral college. But. I don't know. I think that momentum factor of like what direction are we trending really, really influences people. Yeah. And the analogy I actually like to give people is that we're very bad at gauging statistical probabilities and how frequently something happens. So when Steph Curry goes up for a game winning three, a lot of fans are like, oh, game over. He's got this. And the truth is, more often than not, he misses that shot. Yet, you wouldn't know that if you were just going on your anecdotal evidence. And it's because we're very, very bad at processing these types of probabilities in our mind. It gets to the point where if you ask someone, what are your odds of a specific event happening? And they actually gave you a response. It's almost certainly skewed to one direction or the other. It's either like, 10%, 50%, or 90%. And there's no real there's no real middle ground that people have in probabilities. And this is why if Harris is at 33% and she wins the election, that's not a surprise to anyone with a good grasp of statistics. And that's what Trump was at in 2016. Trump had a 30% chance of winning the election based on the data we had even back then. Based on the data we had, Good models like Nate Silver's 538 gave Donald Trump a 30% chance of winning the election. Yet when election night came around, everyone was startled because they had translated that 70% in their mind to a 95% based on their own priors and their own massaging of data and whatnot. And they were left gobsmacked when it didn't happen. And the same thing happened in 2022, if you remember. We had this big narrative about the red wave. And even the New York Times was like, we think our polls are wrong because they don't show a red wave and we're pretty certain there's going to be one. And then the red wave didn't happen. And everyone was like, well, it was obvious because the poll said this. And I was like, no, no, actually, before the election, when, you know, Katie Hobbs had a 35 percent chance of winning, people were writing profiles about Carrie Lake as the next vice president of the United States. And this is all because. No one here is able to grapple with odds properly and understand that the bounds of uncertainty are way bigger than what you want to admit. You know, the average poll bias is like three points per election cycle. Yeah. And and three points that we can't predict in either direction. And and yet, you know, if the polls, I, I think what really happens here is that we've had elections in the past where a three point 
poem is wouldn't really matter much. You know, it certainly like the the Clinton victories, uh, the Bill Clinton victories. It, it really wouldn't have mattered to have a three point poll because Bill Clinton won pretty convincingly. And, you know, maybe like the George Bush, I, I don't know, The certainly his first one was very close, but we Obama's victory, you know, a three point poll miss wouldn't really have mattered. And it's just because we're now in this era where like every election seems to be within a couple points. And certainly the swing states seem to be within one to two points every single time that like now a three point miss like feels catastrophic, even though it's historically pretty normal. And not only that, but if you had a three point miss in either direction, it would result in one candidate probably sweeping all the swing states. In fact, you can argue that the median outcome or the modal outcome is that one candidate sweeps every single swing state. And that would just seem so startling. Yeah, like a, bi a bimodal, like a bimodal distribution where it would be really, it would be really easy for Trump to win every swing state if there's a three or four point error in his direction. It would also be really easy for uh, Harris to win every swing state if there's a three point error in her direction. And it's almost less likely that you actually get some of them, you know, some to Harris, some to Trump, like two different peaks on that graph, right? Totally. And I said that I don't think this election is a realignment election and that the close polls match up with everything we know and that it's probably a good reflection of the fact that the race is likely to be close or at least that there's no candidate that has a clear advantage. But Swings of one to two points or three points are not realignments by any stretch of the imagination. They're not landslides. They're not realignments. Those types of swings happen all the time. The trends of states are very random. The movements at the margins are very, very random because the electorate changes from cycle to cycle. 15% of 2020 voters or of 2024 voters probably didn't vote in 2020. And more than that, you just get people changing their mind in either direction and it just messes with things. And so if you get Harris winning North Carolina, is that really that big of a surprise? No, Biden lost it by a point and a half last time, but we've conditioned our minds to at once price in a substantial polling error for Trump because we're repeating 2020 and 2016. And yet at the same time, bake in a very, very heavy prior that everything will look the same as it did in 2020. And this is because I think we have a tendency to always try and predict the last election. And whether you're predicting 2022 again, or you're predicting 2020 again, fundamentally, a lot of this comes down to people are trying to predict the last election that they think was representative. And this leads to all types of contradictory theories and all types of crazy takes getting thrown about with way too much confidence. Yeah, to some level, the best we can do is, you know, we aggregate the polls, we translate some sort of polling average into a probability number, and then we just acknowledge that, you know, hey, there it could swing either way. Be prepared. Um, and one thing, one final thing, and we'll, we'll get off the polls after this one, but one final theory that I've seen bandied about, you know, in the great discourse of election uh, internet is that there are systematic biases to the polls because of kind of who the pollsters are. Specifically, this is Democrats who complain, oh, you've got this polling average, but half of it is made up of like ex explicitly right wing firms that are just trying to to flood your average with a bunch of biased polls. And if you only count, you know, the good polls from like solid, respectable institutions, then that would actually have Harris up by much more. And it's it's just these biased right wing polls that are flooding the zone. When you hear that, do you think that's a valid form of criticism? Is it something you've investigated? So my take on this is always a little bit interesting because I think it's simultaneously a valid form of criticism for readers to have, and yet it's not something that actually moves a needle when we investigated it. And that seems contradictory because if I think it's a valid form of criticism, why am I also saying it doesn't make a difference? And the answer is this. I don't expect readers to have the same familiarity with the immense volume of data that gets put out there as modelers do. And a lot of people on Twitter, which is really where they get all this stuff, amplify 
the same type of result on both sides. They highlight extremes. Who's more likely to put out extreme results? Partisan pollsters on either side or incompetent ones. And increasingly, unfortunately, we've seen a lot of incompetent Republican pollsters like Trafalgar or Rasmussen or Qantas Insights or whatever come out recently. Now, what happens is this. People see that and they rightfully say, what the hell? This is not good methodology. This is an extremely methodologically opaque firm that is retweeting stuff about election fraud. What is going on here? And I think that is a valid concern. But think about it this way. If readers are concerned about that, you can bet that modelers are too. And we take a lot of steps to ensure that our averages are somewhat robust to this type of thing. We weight really heavily based on quality at Split Ticket, and I know 538 and Silver Bolt and do as well. We include adjustments for partisan pollsters. So if someone is affiliated with a party and they're releasing a poll on behalf of a client, a PAC, or a party, you can generally assume that there is some consistent level of bias in favor of that party from that released result. And we actually apply an in-house adjustment for these types of partisan effects, house effects, etc. So as a result, we've taken a lot of steps to guard against this exact thing happening. And broadly, they work. If you take out all of those partisan polls, and this is another favorite boogeyman of Democrats lately, if you take out Atlas Intel, which has shown Trump doing way better in Pennsylvania and Michigan and nationally than any other poll has, Harris's win probability goes from 53% to 52%. It's almost indistinguishable. And that's because we built our aggregates to be so robust to this type of thing. I think it's a valid concern, again, in that coverage is different from what the polling aggregates say. And I don't expect readers to be able to make that distinction because they have better things to do with their life and more productive things to do with their time. But again, if they've thought of it, so have we. And we've taken a lot of steps to make sure that this does not impact the average. We've investigated it and it actually doesn't. You know what this reminds me of is um, w when they release the jobs numbers, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a second, because if you're in econ world, like I have been in the past, whenever they release the jobs numbers, there's inevitably, inevitably, every single time, a swarm of people who say, well, have they thought, what? it's probably just people doing two jobs at once, or you know, it's probably that people gave up looking for work, or it's probably just all like shitty part-time jobs. And every single time we have to explain, no, the economists at the Federal Reserve and the National Board of, you know, uh, and, and all these places, uh, like they have thought of these things as well. They also track that and they also track that. And that other thing you complain about, they also track that. You have not thought of something that the thousands of economists who work on this stuff did not think of. You are not doing anything original here. And that's kind of, it seems to me, what's happening here is like, you know, all these people have rightfully have questions like, didn't you guys, what if this thing happens with the polls? And what if this, what if that? But I kind of want to say, no, you personally, you know, guy with 50 top followers on Twitter, you have not thought of something that Nate Silver and Elliot Morris and Laksha Jane and all of the other guys have never thought of before. I promise you they've put thousands of hours into thinking about this. You have not got, unless, unless you... I don't know, maybe somebody out there has a new theory for you, Mr. Jane, but it's unlikely that they have thought of something you have not considered yet. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's it's not to discount the wisdom of the crowd or from people reading this stuff, because again, people flag all types of interesting stuff to us without public, you know, without public tracking, we would never have known, for example, that one of the Wisconsin polls was sponsored by the Field of Freedom PAC, which is basically led by a Republican that headed Trump's um, campaign. But that's slightly different from, you know, people confidently saying, oh, well, these guys just don't adjust for that. And therefore, you can disregard it because it's all biased. Like, no, I promise we have thought about this. <laughs> we have put in a lot of work here. And while every input is appreciated and we learn a lot from it, we also wish that sometimes people would trust us. 
Oh man, welcome, welcome to uh, reality. Though nobody will yeah. ever trust you. You're one of those liberal media elites. <laughs> um, I said that that was the last polling question. I have one more quick one. We'll just make this a quick hitter. Um, herding is the thing that occurs when pollsters are afraid to put out results that look like they're out from the average. Do you think herding has occurred this cycle? Do you think that's maybe part of why everything seems so stable? Is that all the pollsters are herding together? Oh boy, I think. One, yes, simply, yes, that is a thing pollsters do. They do it a lot. And when they do that, it helps each individual pollster's rating, in a sense, if you're not careful about it, because their individual error goes down. If you just go with what the crowd says, the crowd is more likely than not to be right compared to an outlier. But it also makes the overall aggregate way less reliable. Because everyone is working with the same exact theory of the electorate and trying to fit in results to that prior, therefore you get the same result predicted by everyone and that kind of nerfs the point of an average. So yes, herding happens. But the bigger issue is that pollsters are now waiting on a set of very tightly defined factors that correlate very, very heavily with partisanship. A common one that people talk about now is recalled vote. They wait on recalled vote. And what that means is they basically create an electorate that has the right number of Biden voters from 2020, the right number of Trump voters from 2020 in proportion, and then the right number of non-voters in 2020 by their estimation. And what that does is it basically says, okay, we're going to have an electorate that looks very much like 2020 in partisan lean. And we go from there. Now, the problem is empirically recalled vote is not necessarily a super reliable metric. People forget which candidate they vote for. Sometimes they give the wrong answer and people move. In Florida, for example, when people move from Wisconsin to Florida or whatever, the the problem with recalled vote then is that yeah, sure. They voted for Trump in 2020 or they voted for Biden in 2020, but they didn't do that in the state of Florida. They did that in the state of Wisconsin or Pennsylvania. And now they're answering a poll in their new state, but they weren't part of that electorate last time. And if you're not careful, and a lot of people aren't, this is going to lead to meaningfully different results that can misrepresent the electorate because you're building an electorate that never really existed in the first place, so to say. Right, because you're now counting a person from Wisconsin as having voted in Florida last time, and you're saying, "Okay, that's part of our Biden pool of voters." No, they they weren't even in the state. Some pollsters, like the Times, can be careful about this if they ever conduct the experiment. But the Times, for this reason, says we're not even going to bother to wait on recalled vote. We wait on party ID, modeled party ID. That's got its problems, but at least it doesn't predict 2020 all over again. And This is countered by the fact that every pollster that does do recalled vote finds the same result. Like you said, is that hurting? Is that them just waiting to a tightly defined set of parameters? It's hard to tell where one line ends and another begins, but broadly speaking, they find a different set of results and they say this has improved accuracy for us in the past because... They're no longer suffering from the shy Trump or the silent Trump effect that we talked about earlier. When you make sure you have a certain number of Trump voters in a poll, you are almost definitionally not not going to underestimate Trump's vote share by eight points again. So it's a trade off. So, yeah, it, it it's all I mean, all these things are actually very difficult problems. Polling, it, especially when you get to the idea that, you know, you're really only getting one to two percent of people to answer their phones. Um, it's, uh, it's a difficult problem and, and you can hack your way to a solution, but there's always going to be side effects from trying to, to hack your way to a solution when when the sample size is that potentially skewed, but enough about polling. We've talked about that for a while. We're, we're coming down the home stretch now. There's not a lot of time left for, for big changes to happen. We could be surprised. Maybe something earth shattering happens, um, in the next week or so, but we kind of feel like we know what the state of the race is, is likely to look like when it goes into election night. And my question for you then is, 
what are you going to be looking for? As somebody who thinks about this all the time, as somebody who thinks about these models and these polls and the way that people vote and the distributions, when election night results start coming in, what are you going to be looking at that's going to make you say, oh man, this is a really good night for Harris? Or conversely, oh, look at that. That means this is a really good night for Trump. I think if you know what to look for, you can make an inference earlier than everyone else based on the completed counties that have finished, even in safe states. Let me give you an example. My favorite is Hamilton County, Indiana. This is in a state that is unambiguously not competitive by any stretch of the imagination. Donald Trump will win Indiana by 15 points or more. But, but, here's the important part. The same demographic trends that are seen all across the nation, Indiana's not going to be immune to them, right? It's probably going to suffer from the same ones. It's just that compositionally, Indiana has more non-college whites, less college-educated whites, less black folks than, say, Georgia does or Arizona does or something like that. Where does this get to? It means that if you look at specific localities in Indiana, which completes counting before almost any other state in the country, you can figure out how certain demographics are likely to trend. So Hamilton County is super college educated, very, very white, and exactly the type of place that is stampeded left in the Trump era and has gone from very, very solidly Republican to pretty swingy and should be a toss up this year or close to that. So if Harris is making significant gains there, that should update your priors and how she's going to do in the Philadelphia caller. That should update, you should update your priors and how she may do in Arizona, in Maricopa County. That should update your inferences on how she may do in the Georgia suburbs in Atlanta and all of those types of things. So I look at those types of completed counties. And I want to see how is Harris doing there? How is Trump doing there? And that can tell us pretty early. Are we going to have an early night or are we going to have a scenario in which we may be suffering for a few days trying to figure out who's going to win? And the other thing is that people are going to make a lot of irresponsible inferences based on ballot reporting order. This time around, Pennsylvania is going to drop a lot of vote by mail votes first. So you're going to get a blue mirage, which is the reverse of 2020. What's going to happen then is people are going to say, well, at the start, Harris was up by a lot in the drops and that's the opposite of 2020. Therefore, Harris must be on track for a landslide. And it's no, obviously not. It's just literally that the voting reporting order is different. So that's the, that's the type of thing that I'm not going to be looking for. And then the completed county margins is what I am going to be looking for, because that can tell us a lot more about the state as a whole and about the country as a whole, really, even if you're looking in safe states. Part of me wonders if the whole vote by mail thing that people try to do is even going to translate this time, because in, in 2020, people pretty rightly assumed that, you know, Democrats mo vote more often by mail and and that was for a variety of factors, but it was especially just obviously true that Donald Trump was literally telling people don't vote by mail. Like he was haranguing, you know, going on rants about how evil vote by mail was. And Democrats were the COVID cautious party. Everybody who thought COVID was super deadly tended to be very heavily Democrat that year. And so just, you know, it very, very obviously vote by mail was going to be heavily Democratic. And and maybe that carries over to 2024, but I'm not sure that it does in, in the same way because COVID is no longer a factor and the Republicans have embraced vote by mail. And I wonder if like that, the, the special amount that Democrats were, were really, really highly going to win vote by mail in 2020, I wonder if that was like a single election thing based on some idiosyncratic factors. Oh, I mean, it obviously was. Democrats in 2020, I think we forget now, but they were terrified that their mail ballots wouldn't be counted if they sent them in late. So they sent them in as early as possible because they thought that the postmaster general was going to screw with them. You may remember the Louis DeJoy theories. And so 
This time around, we're seeing that's not necessarily the case. The Republicans have embraced vote by mail in ways that they did not in 2020. Yes, Democrats still generally vote early um, compared to Republicans, but it's not to the same degree. There's not the same ridiculous skew as in 2020. You can look at this through individual voter file data, or if you don't have the time for that, just look at the splits from 2022, and you'll see that the vote choice or the vote type started to get depolarized, where more Republicans started to vote early, more Democrats started to vote in person on election day. They're not going to get the same types of numbers that they did in 2020. It's just a very different electorate. Now, this has led to people making all types of irresponsible assumptions like that Harris is going to win Virginia by only four after Biden won it by 10 because the early vote looks great for Virginia Republicans is what they say. And I'm like, every time I've seen this analysis, usually it's turned out with people getting burned. And it's it's funny to me, right, that if these people who are noticing it on Twitter with 70, 80, 90 followers and a blue check and tweeting to um, Michelle Steele fan and whatnot. If they're finding these amazing data points that shows Virginia is only three points towards the Democrats, well, why hasn't either campaign made a play for it in advertising? Why haven't any high quality pollsters found the race to be that close lately? You would expect it to show up somewhere, right? So- the official advice from Split Ticket is don't pay that. I mean, you can pay attention to it if you want to, but don't pay that much attention to vote by mail margins or, or you know, Republicans are doing better than vote by mail or Democrats are doing better than vote by mail. But instead, try to pick some demographically interesting counties, maybe maybe one like you mentioned in Indiana that over indexes on college educated whites and maybe, you know, pick a, a couple of good rural counties that have lots of rural whites and maybe some counties with with a high black population and kind of try to see what what the and just track how they swing and just track you know what does it look like the rural white vote is going to do this year is it high turnout is it is it heavily more heavily for donald trump same thing with the black vote same thing with um the you know college educated white vote i was almost going to say the hispanic vote but that one i don't think you can actually do because i think like Florida Hispanics and Arizona Hispanics are actually pretty different. I think that one is just more difficult to uh, to kind of extrapolate from. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's about making decisions and inferences based on a reliable set of data. And when a county completes counting, we know that those are the results and that we can get a read on how a certain demographic is trending. Like we know how college educated whites voted in this area, probably representative of college educated whites trends overall, or at least should give you some signal. With the early vote, we don't even know what it's going to look like, what the splits are, how it's going to fill through the next few days. Why bother making inferences off of things that you cannot properly quantify, understand, or predict? To move away from the presidential race for a second, what does the split ticket model say the state of the race is for the control of Congress, for the House and the Senate? How are you guys thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, in our modeling, the Senate is pretty firmly in the Republican column. Democrats have about one in four chance of keeping it. It's not impossible that Democrats could keep the Senate, but you would very clearly rather be the Republicans because they just need to flip two of West Virginia, Montana, and Ohio. And of those, West Virginia is already an auto flip. Montana is looking more and more likely for the Republicans. And she, he has really opened up a lead and started pulling away from testers. So for us, we look at that and we think, yeah, yeah. It's it's tough for Democrats. Maybe they pull a rabbit out of a hat and flip Texas or Nebraska somehow. But the truth is, there's very few pickup opportunities for them. And even though Sherrod Brown has run well in Ohio, and even though broadly Republicans have nominated some pretty terrible candidates in some of these states like Arizona, it's it's a very favorable hand that they're playing with. And they can get a lot wrong and still win. It's almost like 
there was someone who was telling me about house flipping and he was like, look, you can get a lot of things wrong with the house, but if you buy it at the right price, you'll still end up making a profit. In the same way, you can mess up a lot with candidate recruitment, but if you have the right set of states on the map, like West Virginia and Montana, you're going to be favored to take the Senate back. And that's just what it is. Now, with the House, it's a little bit different. With the House, we have Democrats slightly favored. We have a 53% chance for the Democrats, so I guess really more of a toss-up than anything. But there, the candidate quality edge, if anything, cuts for the Democrats. They fundraised a lot more, even though the generic ballot has looked worse for them in polling than 2020. They have so much money that they're able to make races competitive when frankly, they shouldn't be. They're able to launch a lot of attacks on Republicans and on Republican candidates. And in a lot of cases, this boosts their odds a lot. Like in Washington's third, Republicans nominated a bad candidate to start with, with Joe Kent. He already lost to Marie Glusenkamp Perez in 2022, and Kent has almost no money. So even though that's a Trump one seat, we have Perez as a slight favorite precisely because of all of those factors. And that's very much the story of the House in general. It's close, but at the end of the day, we'd probably rather be the Democrats right now. It's, it's very, very close. And I wouldn't be surprised by a GOP win, but yeah, it probably breaks the same way as a presidential, but also seat by seat, Democrats have a slight advantage. This is one of those things where, again, it just we're all kind of at the mercy of does this end up being a, a two point miss for the Democrats or a two point miss in favor of the Republicans? And literally, and that pretty much determines just about everything here. I mean, Jeremiah, you probably remember the 2012 coverage, right? Where people now say, oh, Romney was never beating Obama. That was, you know, Obama's reelection was all but certain based on X, Y, Z. And I'm like, hang on. No, 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 no. I was 15 then. And I remember <laughs> every news article just about how Romney had seized the momentum or how this election was looking like Democrats were blowing it and whatnot. And I was like, hang on a second, guys. That's not what you said back then. Don't retrofit your analysis now to that when you know that's not how you covered the data back then. I think the only person who would get to play that card is Nate Silver because he, his model in defiance of all the punditry showed a, a pretty convincing Obama edge. I think he had it the last month, like 85 to 90 percent or something like that. Yeah. And in a race where he was very much made fun of for not having it as a coin flip. Yep. Yep. Basically. Right. Like Nate Silver was like, yeah, you know, there's a possibility Romney wins, but this is looking a lot better for Obama than anyone thinks. You guys are just looking at your own priors before you're looking at the data. I I am interested and and. I, this won't be something I think that gets decided early in the night um, because of geography, but I'm very interested to see how the Nebraska race turns out. I think I think if Democrats are going to have a chance to win the Senate, it's because they manage to flip Nebraska. I'm I'm not going to get tricked by Ted Cruz again because Democrats seem to do this repeatedly that they always think there's a chance. We're always going to defeat Ted Cruz. No, like we I feel like we've been fooled by that before. Um, but Nebraska, I don't know. And I, I don't know that it's likely, but I'm also I'm not willing to rule it out at this point. There's a lot of variance in the Nebraska estimate that perhaps isn't there in the Texas one. Yeah, on average, our model expects Osborne to lose by more than Allred does, but it also recognizes there's a lot more volatility in the Nebraska race. And so very strange things can happen. I will say that in the past, when you have things like Greg Orman, in um, Kansas in 2014 with Pat Roberts, Orman was leading in a lot of polls, then he lost by 10. And that's because as the election neared, a lot of people remembered, wait a sec, I'm a Republican. I hate this. And I think to some degree, Osborne has done a very good job at insulating himself from that. You know, if you look at his campaign aesthetics, he's running with red signs. He's keeping a very, very- I love it, by the way. I've seen him in his graphics yeah. on Twitter that he puts um, the Republican in blue and himself in red. And I just I love that he's doing that. Right. It's like it's like we're back in London <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's a very smart strategy. I, I think he's run a very good campaign and the Republicans were blindsided by this race becoming competitive because they did not think they needed to worry about it, obviously. So I think if Democrats are to win the Senate, if they have a better night than expected, it carries over across levels, this polling error. 
and it would probably show an Osborne doing a lot better than expected in Nebraska, like Evan McMullen in Utah came with a nine points of winning in 2022. And everyone was like, oh my God, what the heck? We didn't expect that. So that's the type of thing where when I see the results, I'll be looking for how does Osborne do in Nebraska? Because I'm really curious to see, does everyone in Nebraska remember that they're Republicans or does Osborne's populisty type of shtick carry over until after election day? All right. Well, we're coming up on time here soon. So I want to ask the final question that we always ask on this podcast, and that is, where can people go to learn more? If they're interested in what we're talking about, about the ideas of modeling, polling, what's going to happen on election night, what to look for. Obviously, you guys at, at Split Ticket do great work, and everybody should go check out the Split Ticket model, and the Split Ticket website has a lot of good analysis. Um, I'm happy to throw your name in the ring. But uh, other than your own stuff, is there anything that you find helpful that you would recommend to readers or listeners who want to learn more about just all the things we're talking about here today? Yeah, I think the New York Times, as always, has great analysis, high quality polling. Definitely, if you were only to read the New York Times or the Washington Post political election data related coverage of the race, you would be totally fine. Um, 538 is fantastic. Silver Bulletin as well. I think everyone's familiar with those though. So let me give one or two sites that don't get the appreciation they should, but that have really good data. Race to the White House with Logan Phillips. That's a really good one. And then um, on top of that, I would say Vote Hub has a really good polling aggregator, which actually explicitly rejects partisan polls and takes only high quality nonpartisan polls. So I would say, you know, outside of the traditional media sources, those are two of the best sites to go and look at if you're really trying to get your fix of election data. Maybe you can help me remember. There's one more thing that I want to recommend to listeners, but I, I can't remember the exact name of it. I feel like there's some prediction service that basically they, they only operate like once election results have started coming in and basically what they do is they look like county by county, like what we've got 20% of this rural county at this percentage and we've got 80% of this rural count or this urban county and we know their general partisan lean and so we extrapolate like what the final result of the state will be. Do you know who I'm talking about? There's somebody who does this. That sounds like you're just describing the New York Times needle. <laughs> it, it might just be the needle, um, but th there's some, maybe it's like decision desk or something like that. Um, oh, DDHQ does something like that, I think. Yeah, yeah. DDHQ. Decision desk HQ. And um, and so decision desk HQ is, is, I find, a really good, like, if you're on election night and you need something to follow, first of all, follow the, the Center for New Liberalism stream on Twitch. Um, we will be live streaming, but we will be following the decision desk HQ and the New York Times um, and like those kind of like county by county analysis to see like, you know, what does it really mean that Harris is up in Pennsylvania right now? Is it reliable yet? Or is it, you know, w what might be the case? So um, that's one more thing I'll throw in there. And with that, I think we will bring it to a close. I want to say thank you to my guest one more time, Laksha Jane. Thank you for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. This was great fun.